Yeah, it's okay for me. Okay. So uh, today's for today's session, uh, I want to make it as interactive as possible. So I'm also going to need uh, the audience to respond as well from time to time. So today's session is going to be a question which asked, which has been asked from a really, really long period of time. And we are still asking and we have no idea. I mean, the more we get close to an answer, the more it seems that we need to know more to get to that certainty of whether we are really alone in the universe. But still, we have come quite far. We have modern technologies now. We have space telescopes now. We are so basically the because of the space telescopes, we are, we are able to get a better view of the stars and the planets. So there are a lot of advantages that we have today, which we didn't have before. But the question still persists and we still do not have the answer. That's what's not changed yet. So that's the question. Are we alone in this universe? So like uh, uh, on your screen, you will see that there is a raise hand option in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, can everybody see that? So can people just raise their hands? Those who think that you, we are actually alone in the universe. So is anybody raising hands? Yeah, you have one vote. Okay, uh, since I cannot uh, see how many people are raising hands all the time, uh, Ritam Dada, can you just uh, uh, like tell me on that? How many hands are we seeing? Yeah. Okay, I still. Um, yeah, uh, so far, we have only one hand raised. Okay, so most people think that uh, we are not alone indeed. So yeah, because if we were indeed alone, then we would have to be something really, really special. And, and that would be a lot of waste of a lot of space out there. So before we move on to ask to try to answer the question, and also one more thing, uh, this presentation is going to have more questions than answers, because that's where we are at uh, right now at this point in this subject of how are we ever, I mean, are we alone in the universe in the first place? So first question one may ask is why bother even asking that question in the first place? Because we are living in a world filled with poverty and people are not getting food on the plate all the time. And there are so many other problems with money and resources on this planet. So why even bother asking, right? So people such as, for example, uh, my favorite, uh, he's the head astronomer at SETI Institute, Seth Shostak. So people like him like to believe that even though exploration has been a part of, our spe of us as a species since the very beginning, we still shouldn't just say that we should explore because it's a need for us as a species to explore other grounds to see what's out there. But it should be more closer to the heart. Exploration should be like a thirst. So for example, that's why I uh, made this slide like that. So how many people can remember what happened in 1969? And when I say 1969, what generally comes to your mind? Like you can just unmute your mic and just say, does something come up in the mind when I say 1969? The year. You can unmute yeah, your I, mic and just. I think, I think Neil Armstrong, he landed on moon. It's yeah. With the other crew members. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So here I have an audio. Just one moment. Are you playing the audio? 
Yeah, sorry. Are you playing the audio clip? Yeah. Um, did, uh, did everyone hear the audio? Was that audio audible? No. Audio okay. is audible. Okay, so everyone got that right. That was Neil Armstrong's transmission when he landed on the moon. So these are the small little trans uh, like transmissions, which like stay in prolonged in the whole human history. Uh, so sorry, Vikram, these... but uh, can you play that audio again because I could hear it. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sorry to interrupt, but I don't think the audio is particularly audible to anyone. The audio is not audible. Oh, it's not. Okay. So raise the volume. No. It's on maximum not volume. Right now. No, that's uh, that's because I have uh, paused it. Is it now audible? Was that audible? I mean, uh, the audio is not playing all the oh, time, and the dialogues are very. No, not right now. Uh, yeah, now. Now is it okay? I'm not sure it's audible. Oh, no, it's not it's audible. In... I think it is audible. One minute. Was that completely not audible? Um, I'm sorry to say, but it wasn't. I think you can get on with your presentation. You can provide a link to the audio later. Okay, okay. Yeah, because uh, the audio is in NASA's website, basically. Basically, that was Neil Armstrong landing on the moon. Okay, so, so let's start from the very beginning. So these two people are uh, one of the people, I mean, two of the most important people and more were there who supported the Big Bang Theory. Which, so I mean, the theory which is we fam famously call Big Bang, which suggests that at first there was a single point and then the universe emerged from there. So going by that theory, it all happened about 13.8 billion years ago when the universe came into existence. So after that, about it took about 9 billion years before Earth was formed. Then even after Earth was formed, after those nine billion years, it took about another billion years to cool down and then life could emerge. So basically it took a really long time for evolution to first, I mean, it first of all, it took a really, really long time for life to emerge. And then some more, long, I mean, some, a lot of long time for us to emerge in the first place. So. I said that uh, period was 9 billion years when Earth cooled, uh, was starting to cool. I mean, when Earth came into existence and then it took a billion years more for it to cool down. So that brings us to somewhere near 10 billion years. So now we are almost skipping ahead 3 billion years. So this is 7 million years ago. So first of our ancestors came into this planet and even when they came, they were also curious about what lay beyond the skies, about what was out there. And even they explored islands and roamed seas. And even they were curious as to what was going on here. So even today, from that point, even today, when we look up at the sky, we still all are dumbstruck or awed in wonder at what lies ahead. So if we are to find someone from another planet and life, which is not originated on earth. So like how likely are we to find them? So let's do a little bit of scaling. So our home, which is the Milky Way galaxy has about 200 to 500 billion stars. And it is one of the largest galaxy of the 32 local group of galaxies, but our galaxy is not even the largest in the local group. 
So let's try to visualize just how big our galaxy is. So here, if that small grain of sand is just us, our solar system, our sun and the planets, then this heap is the Milky Way. So in this heap, the small grain of sand is us. And within the and this smaller grain of sand is not even Earth. This is the solar system. Within this small grain of sand is somewhere a tiny blue planet where we belong. Okay, so if you ever go stargazing and you just stretch out your thumb towards the sky and try to ponder what's what lies beyond your thumb at that part of the sky, this is what lies. So you can see a lot of kinds of galaxies here. For example, this is an elliptical galaxy. As you can see from its shape, it's slightly elliptical. So that's how it got its name. This is a spiral galaxy. And then there are lenticular galaxies and some other kinds of galaxies there. So basically all of these, whatever you see here are not stars, but they are galaxies. And that's all just under your thumb. That's just one small part of the sky. So our universe is as big as this. I mean, sorry, our Milky Way galaxy is as big as this and a small part of a universe is as big as this, consisting of so many galaxies. So what are the odds therefore? So Frank Drake, the scientist proposed in 1961, actually when the scientist proposed this Drake's equa uh, his equation, which is known as the Drake's equation, uh, the thing is that the Big Bang Theory was not yet properly established till at that point. So after that, there were certain modifications, which I've shown in the next few slides. So first of all, let's see what the Drake equation is. So say n is number of civilizations which with which we could communicate. So basically n is the number we are trying to find, the number of alien civilizations there might be intelligent alien civilizations rather so for n to for us to find n these are the factors required so first of all we can see that there is this r star so that r star is the mean rate of star formation which for our milky way galaxy is uh within 6.6 minus .6, sorry 0 0.68 to 1.45 yes yeah, so it's about uh, 0 0.68 to 1.45 solar mass per year. So basically what this means is that uh, a solar mass of, sorry, uh, was anyone saying something? Okay, uh, so what this basically means is that a so amount of, I mean, what the, whatever the number of stars are, formed in a cer uh, certain year approximately, they will lie between this and this amount of solar mass, which means, uh, let's say there is a star of 0 0.5 solar mass and another star of 0 0.5 solar mass. So that will bring us to one solar mass of star formation. So that's how. So maybe there are two stars formed that year or maybe just one star of one solar mass or something like that. Okay. so. Once we are true with the solar mass, the rate of star formation, then we have to know what is the fraction of stars which have planets. So basically when Frank Drake proposed this equation, it's more or less very intuitive because first of all, what we need to know if there is life elsewhere is whether life originated there. And if life had to originate there, we, we must have and there has to be some planet or something. And if a planet is there, then the star is, then the star should also be there. So first of all, we should consider how many stars are there. So here we have, we are taking the mean rate of star formation and then we are multiplying that by the fraction of stars, which have planets because for life to exist, we are, uh, like taking into consideration the fact that you need a planet for life to begin in the first place. Now, if we, if the star has planet, now after that, we need to know the mean number of planets which could support life per star system, which means the number of habitable planets per star system. So the, we will be coming to this later 
so the number of habitable planets in a star system is determined by the number of planets within something called the goldilocks zone so the goldilocks zone is something which is a zone which is neither too hot for a planet nor too cold for a planet because let's say you have a star of a certain solar mass solar mass is basically one solar mass is considered to be the mass of a sun and what uh, say we are saying talking about the star of two solar mass so that means two sun that uh, star is equivalent of two suns so like that so depending upon the solar mass of the star that is how big the star is the goldilocks zone can shift around so basically let's say uh, a planet is a uh, really really far away from a star so that would result in the planet being getting really cold and frozen so life to life for life to occur we need some temperature so that the reactions can go on for life to happen so that's something which we are saying that no life cannot happen in that much cold and anyways life will we will all die if that much if we go to some place that, that cold and if we are too close to the sun that will also not work because if you are too close to the sun we will just burn up at just too uh, too much temperature so in between that part uh, there is something called the goldilocks zone which tells us the probability of a planet having uh, i mean having the capability of having liquid water and therefore life so after that the thing is that we know what is this we have also found a lot of planets a lot of exoplanets rather i should say which have um which have habitable conditions so we know the fraction of stars which have planets we know the mean number of planets which are habitable what we don't know are these three things because first of all earth is the only place we know to have life so that's why we do not know any of anything about these three because for fl to happen we need to know life supporting planet which develops life so we don't know if anything has developed life or whether if the life has been developed it's intelligent or whether it's intelligent enough to communicate so you can just put in anything you want here and get your own result we have absolutely no data about these three so essentially since we have some good amount of data about these three so what you can say is that these three are kind of constant so what now matters is this see there is an alien civilization out there somewhere now for that alien civilization to communicate to us it has to live right if it doesn't live in the first place and then how do we expect it to communicate and by live i mean that the length of time that they can com communicate means that they have developed radio technology or some means of communication and after that maybe say 100 years later they had some epidemic or some plague or they had a war and destroyed themselves so this is what's mainly our concern since we do not know anything about these three and these three are con uh, constants but still since we have no idea whether life even exists anywhere with, apart from earth we are not going to go into that so shortly this is a bit more modified version where this is the observe the span of the observable universe and n is basically the number of habitable planets in a given volume of that universe and f is probability of those planets harboring intelligent life which are in also capable of communication now after that you have to just add uh, multiply the longevity factor to see whether that act I and mean, they might be able to communicate with us some day or not so basically we do not know anything about this all we know is this so the question arises is how do we therefore search for them at least gather these data so the data that we saw previously well, we have a lot of means of gathering that data for example the rate of star formation is quite comparatively simple because that's just us looking at the universe and just taking a lot of pictures and a lot of data and seeing what the average rate of star formation is so this is seti and the image that i have taken is uh, the large 
the as it's written Carl G. Jansky, very large area, and it's in New Mexico. So the SETI Institute is search for extraterrestrial intelligence. It its main mission is that it's going to look for aliens. That's its whole mission, and it's a non-profit organization which was actually found by Carl Sagan and Jill Tarter. So essentially when we are looking up at the sky, this is, this is, I'm, this is not exact. I mean, this is just more or less what we are trying to look for. So a dip in lumens of music amends the electromagnetic noise modifications to the Goldilocks zone and ourselves. Now, what I mean by ourselves is that uh, there was this recent study published in a, uh, published by the Nottingham University. Well, we'll be coming to that later, but there uh, a guy named uh, Professor Christopher Consilis. So he says that our new research suggests searches for extraterrestrial intelligent civilizations not only reveals the existence of how life forms but also gives us clues for how long our own civilization will last. So basically, if we find intelligent life elsewhere, it's kind of like looking into a mirror of ourselves that, okay, so if they are there and they have lived for so many years, that means we also have high hopes as intelligent beings that, okay, so we also have a good chance of living for so many years. And if we find that they have died out or something like that, I mean, it's not that we are also going to same, uh, face the same fate, but it's not exactly that encouraging as, as well. So let's move on. So his name is David Charbonneau, as written. So basically, this is the guy. So basically, this is the guy who saw the first transit. I mean, this was, it was his idea that you should find planets by the, using the concept that whenever a planet passes in front of a star, that star's intensity of light is going to dim. That intensity is going to take a drop. So that was actually a very, very useful idea to have. So we now use that technique a lot actually. And I'll be showing you the data in the next slides. So this is the Kepler telescope. Thanks to this telescope, a lot of planets, I mean, sorry, exoplanets has, have been discovered. A lot of stars have been discovered and uh, we are a lot closer to, I mean, we have gathered a lot of data basically on those first three variables. We still don't know whether uh, life exists anywhere else apart from Earth. Till now, Earth is the only place where life ever happened. Also, uh, these two are the people who got the Nobel Prize for discovering an exoplanet and that to orbiting a solar type star. So maybe that planet could be our home someday in the future. So coming to detection methods. So in order to detect the planets, these are some of the methods that we have. Now, as you can see, there are five methods mainly and the um, like the amount of planets found by transit. So this is this number here is the amount of planets found by each method. And this whole information is from NASA directly. And Kepler has found about 50%, more than 50% of these planets. So transit is actually very, very useful in finding uh, planets orbiting the stars. After that comes radial imaging. And as you can see, there is this technique called astrometry. Uh, I'll actually be covering this technique and this technique. And after that, if someone has questions, they can ask and I'll explain these three as well. So basically this is the most useful technique. And this is one of the first techniques that we used radial imaging in order to detect whether there are other planets. I mean, whether there are other planets outside our solar system which are going around the star. Okay. So, 
So let's come to the first two methods, which are the transit method and the radial imaging method. So the radial imaging method, let's come to that later. First, let's look at the transit method. So the fun thing about transit method is that there are situations, even though the transit method has found a lot of planets, the thing is that there are there can be situations where the transit method is actually a bit helpless. So basically what the transit method is, is that say you have a star here, a really, really bright star. Now, do you think that if we just take a telescope or just look at the star with our naked eye, we will be able to see anything cross in front of it. I mean, in front, if, um, if Mercury transits our sun, we can more or less observe that because we are really close to it. But in case of these far away stars, we have to rely on machines a lot. So the technique that we use here is say, suppose a planet is in orbit around the star. So when the planet is suppose here, this star is going to have going to have a certain intensity. So let's draw a graph here. So this axis is the axis of time. This axis is the axis of lumens. That is the intensity of the light. So at the beginning, it is going to have a certain intensity, right? But as the planet approaches the star and then slowly enters it, I mean enters as in blocks the light coming from the star. We have photometers here uh, back, I mean, with us on Earth. On Earth as in uh, above there in the skies as well and also in observatories such as the Keck telescope in Hawaii and all the other observatories we have. So what happens is that when the uh, planet starts to come in front of the star, we have a dip in the lumens. So as the planet is crossing, 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 that dip is maintained. And as the planet reaches here and then exits the star, we again have that intensity back. So this drop in intensity is the depth. So this is what the formula is here. So if we, so basically we have uh, methods of finding the radius of the star, which is this, this variable here by checking the amount of light coming from the, the brightness intensity. And like there are a lot of methods of uh, finding that, but we are here interested in finding what about the planet. So we have the depth here in the graph and with this depth, we get a ratio which looks something like this. So this is the radius of the planet squared and this is the radius of the star squared. So since we have this ratio, now we can use this depth to see how big the planet is or rather the volume, I should say. Now, once we have the volume, we also have methods of finding how massive the star is. I'm sorry, how massive the planet is. So coming to that later, but what happens if there are more than just one planet? I mean, of, of course, there is going to be more than one planet. So as the planets orbit around the star, there can be that multiple planets come in front of the star at the same time. And they're of different sizes and shapes. So what happens is we get all kinds of patterns here in this graph of ours, humans versus time. So what essentially happens is say this planet is just entering at first. Let's just remove these planets. So we have a certain dip. Now let's say another planet is entering here. So at first this planet entered and then after a while this planet entered and we have faced a certain a, a bit more dip. Now when this planet exits, this much portion of the dip is going to raise up so this is this much and when this planet is going to exit the whole intensity is going to come back so there are times when we get such graphs and from these graphs 
So we have to determine that how the planets are moving, how many planets are there. Also, uh, one thing you may have noticed is that the farther away the planet is from the sun, the more time it is going to take to go around the star. So like that, the more amount of time the planet takes, the farther away it is. So that's how we try to have what uh, as much as much information as possible about the planet. So apart from this, now let's discuss this radial imaging method. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the transit method? Hello. Hello. Yes. Oh, uh, does anyone have any questions about the transit method? Shall I continue? Yes, you can continue. Okay. So basically, uh, multiple, we have multiple planets and we have the time durations, the dip in humans. So these are the data which we take into account when we are trying to figure out that what the solar system is like there. Okay, so one minute. Hmm. So as far as radial velocity, I mean, sorry, the radial observation goes, what happens here is a very simple fact of a force being equal and opposite in directions. So say a planet is moving around a star and the reason the planet is moving around the star is because of the gravity that the, with which the star is putting the planet towards itself, right? So at the same time, just as the star is putting the planet towards itself, the star, the planet is also going to be putting the star towards itself. So what happens is just as this planet is orbiting the star like this in an elliptical orbit, the star itself also has a very, very minute orbit or rather a wobble. Orbit is not the right term. Rather, this term is used more often. So what will happen is this is going to have, the star is going to have a very slight wobble. Now the greater the intensity of the wobble, the more like, the more the wobble is going to happen, the massive the planet is of that star. And the more number of planets, the more weirder the wobble is going to be. So this wobble that the star makes tells us a lot of, and gives us a lot of information about what this star is having as its planets and what the star is essentially doing. So the way we detect this wobble. So the, now the question is, how do we detect this wobble? So the thing is very simple. Most of the information that we receive from space is mainly electromagnetic radiation, mainly light. And I mean, until recently we have, we didn't know that gravitational waves were actually there. And it was theorized, but it was the detection of gravitational waves is rather very recent in 2015. And we have been start, we have started these things of, uh, like at a time much before, a lot before that. So radial, this radial uh, observation or rather the wobble that we have observed in the stars is one of the first ways to detect whether a star had any planet or not. Because if the star doesn't have any planet, at the most what it can have is another star, which is a binary system. That way it can go around and around each other. But if it does have a planet, if it absolutely doesn't have another star or a planet, it's going to stay still because there is, there isn't really anything which is going to make it wobble on anything. So the question now is how do we detect this wobble? So as this star go, as this planet goes around the star, this star is also going to have a wobble. So let's say this star is moving in this direction. So if star, this star is moving this direction, when this star will be here and moving towards this side, what will happen 
is that we will observe a Doppler redshift in the light. So here comes into play the Doppler's effect where we will have a red shift here. And when it will again come towards this side, we will have a blue shift here. So this is the red shift. And uh, this is all assuming that we, the people of earth are towards something like this. We are somewhere here. So whenever the star is moving towards us, we will have a blue shift. And whenever it's going to move away from us, we are going to have a red shift. Now, observing the patterns in this blue and red shift, we can identify the wobble, which gives us the data of how many planets are there about the star, uh, how they are uh, orbiting the star, and how massive they are. So once we have the data of how massive a star is, and also from this, how big a star is by the volume, we can safely say that we can calculate the planet's density. Also, one of the interesting things about this uh, transit method of finding planets is that, say a planet is here, right in front of the star. What will happen is that if that planet has an atmosphere, the, st the star's light is going to come through the planet's at atmosphere and then reach our telescopes, right? So when, it ha when this happens, with very, very sensitive equipments and measurements, what we can do is we can find the spectral imaging of the composition of the atmosphere. And that might be a very, and that might be in the future. I mean, we need to do a lot more uh, sophistications to our technology. And it is happening, slowly it is happening. So we will be able to know the composition of the atmosphere of that planet. And if we know that, it will be a lot clearer to us whether that planet is habitable or not. So even if we don't find aliens, we will at least find a home. Sorry. Hello. Nothing. I think there's nothing. Any outside noise maybe. It's, you can continue. Okay. So like how many people have seen this movie? Can you just raise your hands? And also, can someone tell me how many hands we are seeing? Huh? Sorry? I Uh, so Shimla Ridhamdara, can anyone tell me how many hands we have seen? Four, five, with increasing six, seven. Okay, so more or less, a lot of people are familiar with this. Ten people at least. Okay, so 50% approximately, uh, less than 50, okay. So this is in interstellar which is a movie completely based on us finding a home elsewhere other than Earth. So in order for us to find a place to live, you also need to know how it began. But first of all, what we need to know is this, the Goldilocks zone. So, so let's talk about the Goldilocks zone for a bit. So say you have a star and a lot of planets are re revolving around that star in, certain, in various orbits from, uh, from certain distances from the star. Like this. Now the thing about Goldilocks zone is that even though it is a very good way of finding out which planets are capable of harboring life, it is not the final statement. So we'll see why soon. So as you can see, this planet here is very close to the star. And this planet here is a lot of uh, like very away from the star, a lot farther. 
So what will happen with this plant is this plant is going to most probably have a ice sheet. And what's going to happen with this plant is that the surface temperatures are going to be too high. So like 200 degrees Celsius or a lot more than that, like 1000 degrees Celsius or something. And then they are going to have a lot of extremes in temperatures, especially if this planet does not have any atmosphere. So one may say that, let's say that these two planets are neither that far nor that close to the sun. So this is how we say that these two planets are within a safe green zone, the habitable zone, or also called the Goldilocks zone. So I'm not very familiar with the story of the three bears called Goldilocks after which this Goldilocks zone was named. But anyhow, so we find the optimal distance which will be safe for the planets from this, from a particular star. And then we define that zone as the Goldilocks zone where the temperature is optimum that uh, the temperature, the exposure to the radiation from the star that they are optimum. So these planets might have water and better yet they might have a life. So these things give us the data on as to which planets and which places can have life. But the thing is that even though the Goldilocks zone is a good explanation of how far a planet should be so that the optimal temperatures and conditions are there for life to happen. It is not the end statement. So it is uh, on, it is actually here. This is a picture of a hydrothermal vent and it's actually an ongoing argument about where exactly life began here on earth. So some say that you need the surface for a certain exposure to the radiation. Otherwise, we would not have been able to sustain the radiation which is coming to us right now for the evolution to happen. Then some say that, no, that does not need to be. There, are, there is enough proof that life can begin in the hydrothermal vents. Why? Because the hydrothermal vents are porous, they are alkaline then they have carbon dioxide they have a way to heat the uh, heat the reaction to make the reaction possible so basically this is a uh, an article i was reading at chemistry world written by the author racial brazil and uh, so this theory here called russell's theory suggests that the pores could serve as templates for cells so this is a possible explanation as to how life can happen in other planets as well. So what, what I mean by that is it is not necessary that you need a, a planet in the Goldilocks zone for life to happen. Why? Because as, I, as I'm trying to make my point here is that if you have a place beneath the surface, which is hot enough, and where reactions can happen, then life could be possible. All you need is a little bit of geothermal temperature beneath the surface of the planet. So that way these hydrothermal vents can serve as cell templates and life could happen. So what I mean by that is that, yeah, so Europa is the smallest of Jupiter's moons. And uh, we have our eyes set on Europa to go and explore there. So if this is Jupiter, let's say, so this is Europa. It's a very small planet. I'm sorry, a moon of Jupiter. One of the smallest of the uh, big four, which are Io, Ganymede, Callisto, uh, Callisto and Europa. So this is Europa. So what's interesting about this particular moon is that the surface of Europa is actually covered in ice sheets. So we are right now predicting that even though the surface is covered with ice sheets, inside there can be liquid ocean, there can be liquid water. But why we are saying this is because 
the thing is that Europa, like uh, any other satellite or any other object going around an, an orbit around another object, it's going to follow an elliptical path where this bigger object is going to be at the center of that, I mean, sorry, the focus of that ellipse. So as Europa goes around Jupiter like this, what's happening is that when it's too far from Jupiter, I mean, at the maximum distance, it's going to have a certain gravity, right? Now, when it's going to come the closest to Jupiter, that gravitational force is going to increase. And here the gravity is more than the gravity here. So what's going to happen is that in this part of the orbit, the gravitational force is going to increase here. It's going to decrease and Eventually, as it goes round and around the orbit, the gravitational force uh, that Europa is having is going to increase and decrease and then increase and decrease. So essentially, what happens to its core is that it gets compressed, decompressed, and then compressed again. So as this process keeps on repeating on and on, what happens is that the molecules there in towards the center of the at the center of Europa, the metal ions and the whole alloy of various metals and other elements, the molecules rub against each other very vigorously. And as they rub continuously going round and round the orbit, they generate heat. And if they generate heat, and since we have already said that this particular moon is covered in ice sheets then there might be liquid ocean beneath the surface of Europa so if there is liquid ocean here that means and also if, since the planet is going round and round and heat is going to be generated we can have hot areas here and therefore if we have oceans and hot areas here it is possible that we can also have hydrothermal vents and therefore Europa could be having life. So it could be that life is indeed possible on Europa. And if life is indeed possible on Europa, so NASA has plans on sending satellite and um, spacecrafts and satellites to Europa to closely examine this particular moon. So the thing is that if, li if life is there, then this could change a lot of things. So therefore, the Goldilock zone need not be the only zone place or the only zone in the solar system of any other star which can have the capability of harboring life. So the next thing that we do is this. So now we have now we have covered the part of finding planets. So this is more or less how we find planets and how they might have life in them. So someone is okay. So Tapu is saying it should have an atmosphere, though. Yeah, of course it should have an atmosphere. But is it necessary to have an atmosphere if the organisms are going to be living inside it? Because if the organisms are going to live inside the surface, I mean, inside the oceans, which is already covered by the ice sheets above, then life might be possible. Because after all, the ice sheets are already acting as a protective cover for the oceans to stay there. And the internal mechanisms of the planet is making the water inside heat up. Therefore, it could be possible that Europa does harbor life but not extraterrestrial, I mean, not extraterrestrial intelligence, maybe. That life need not be intelligent, can be just life. But even if it's just life that, would, life, that would mean that Earth is not the only planet and that could change a lot of things for us. So hearing noises is basically us trying to hear electromagnetic radiation noises. So what I mean by that is, say there is an advanced alien civilization 
So if there is an advanced civil alien civilization and it's trying to communicate with us, what would be its mode of communication? So essentially it should, since light is the only thing which others can detect properly, or rather I should say electromagnetic waves. So probably they are going to try a radio broadcast, send something through the radio. So if they do so send something through the radio wavelength, so which wavelength should they choose? So here is a graph which says, uh, which is giving us an idea about that. So this water hole here, this one. So this water hole here is actually a sun rain. So let's explain this. So this curve that we have here, this curve is basically electromagnetic radiations of much lower frequencies. So if we try to send signals in these frequencies, then the no, I mean, it's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of background noise. So even if we detect, we won't be able to differentiate it properly from the other frequencies that are coming. So this is basically the galactic noise. So this part of the frequency of electromagnetic waves is a lot noisy. Now, here on Earth, since we are having some telescopes like the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and we are trying to detect electromagnetic radiations like that, there are things like uh, the atmosphere, which has these elements in it. So these elements can interfere if the frequency gets too high. So if the frequency gets too low, the galaxies, the stars, and these radiations are going to interfere with us. If the, gas, if the frequency is too high, then the atmosphere is going to interfere. And even if say that we are going to use the, we are going to use a telescope such as the Kepler telescope or some other radio telescope, which is in space to detect. No space, when we say space, space isn't exactly as empty as one might think. Space is actually rather filled with dust particles and a lot of other things which can interfere with that radiation. So the part which we have here is basically the quiet zone. We call this the quiet zone. And the reason that we call this the water hole is that, uh, okay, let's explain it like this. So what happens is we are actually, even though that's called the water hole, let's come to that later. What happens is essentially we are trying to detect their frequencies in the hydrogen line, in the hydrogen frequency. So the way this hydrogen frequency ar arises is this. So we have an hydrogen atom with an electron going around the proton. So what happens is that if both of these have a parallel spin, it often happens that since everything in the universe is trying to become stable, what happens is that it gets converted to them having an anti-parallel spin. So when this transition happens, this releases a certain electromagnetic wave, which happens to be in uh, coming into the wavelength of 21.1 centimeters. So this is that 21 centimeter hydrogen line, which we were talking about. So this frequency here is going to range from 1.420 gigahertz to 1.720 gigahertz. So essentially that's the part of the frequency which we are trying to get since that's the least noisy. But even after that, since I just said that the, this is the hydrogen frequency, we have to, first of all, we need to properly know how to dip and whether or not that source of radiation is artificial or whether it is actually coming from a star because hydrogen is basically what makes up most of the, I mean, part of the universe. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in our universe. 
So what we mean by water hole is that, of course, we have long theorized that in order to have life, we need water, right? So that water hole which you saw there in on that graph is the range of the frequency which what which would have been emitted if there was water. So if there is water, we will have a signal in this frequency that we will be at least able to know that whether some part of the sky has a planet which has water in it, if not alien civilizations. And even if they do have alien civilizations, we would still have to use some AI and some machine learning to identify the artificial ones from the natural ones because right now we, all we have received are the natural ones so we have we have very little idea about what the artificial ones are going to be so this is enrico for me and here i just wanted to introduce the question which he asked which is also known as the fermi paradox that even though the size of the universe is so big and as we can see today that there are a lot of planets out there and uh, so Kepler telescope alone has detected about 2500 to 3000 planets and uh, the total number of planets which we have found is approximately somewhere between 4000 to 5000 planets at a lot closer to 4000 somewhere more, a bit more than 4000 basically so, and out of those 4,000 exoplanets, which we have found more than about 50% of those 4,000 planets have the capability of harboring life. So the question here that we are now asking is that in this universe, which is so noisy with electromagnetic radiation, that there are so many stars and there are so many stars which have planets. The question is like, where is everybody then? Why hasn't life formed elsewhere? Why hasn't intelligent life developed elsewhere? So the question is, is this small blue planet so special? So the question is, should we have high hopes about, our, about finding life elsewhere? Like, should we be pessimistic or should we be op optimistic? So like how many people here think that there is a really, really good chance of finding life elsewhere or rather I should say that how many people think that everybody, what, I mean, whether everybody is out there in the first place. So basically, uh, can I just see a hand who think that there is probably someone out, I mean, some form of life out there, but, but particularly maybe not intelligent. And uh, can someone tell me how many hands we've seen? Five, till now, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten, at least. Okay, so again, a little less than 50%. Okay, so this many people think that, like, probably there is life out there, but maybe not intelligent enough. So that's why maybe they are not able to communicate. So that could be the case. So there was this other scientist named Michael Hart. So he had something to say as to why we are not finding anybody out there. So it could be that the aliens are, are they are intelligent perhaps, but they are not that good in exploration per se, or they are not that good in building radio telescopes and building radio equipments for them to communicate to us, for them to reach out to us in the first place. It could be that their economy is low or something like that. Or it could be that the aliens have something against Earth itself. So they are like that Earth is not a good planet to visit, so let's not visit Earth at all and let's try to maintain our distance from them. Uh, someone is saying something in the chat. There's a hundred percent chance, but we as we well as them need more tech for possibility. Yeah, absolutely. We act, we are actually doing that 
we are actually doing trying to do that exact as well we are trying to develop more te- new technologies for better detection of other civilizations okay so another thing is advanced civilizations are rose way too recently for them to reach us that is that they have they are intelligent they are advanced but they are yet to reach us okay and the fourth point is basically so how many people here have like a very good idea about what the fourth point where the fourth point is coming from can i have a show of hands let's see how many people have watched that thing in history db 18 and uh, can someone tell me how many hands we seen can you repeat your question so oh, the question is uh, about the fourth points that aliens have visited earth in the past but we have not observed them or maybe we have observed them but we considered them to be gods or something we didn't properly document everything this is basically a show in history day 18 all together so how many people have seen that show so how many hands are there till now two hands are there only two people believe that aliens are there <laughs> they came to pass okay so only two people have seen this show and now okay. three at least i uh, three i'm talking about this show four, in history TV 18 five now it's five goes on I'm talking about this show. This is used to happen in History TV 18. The ancient aliens, where they theorize that aliens. There's a question in chat box. Okay. Um. One minute. Area 51 sightings. Yeah. Yeah. So, but actually, the thing is. Okay. <laughs> okay so uh, quite a few number of people do watch ancient aliens or have watched it when it used to happen on history of 18 okay so that show basically talks about whether the gods which we believe in today are actually uh advanced alien civilizations from other planets so they could come to earth and like help us build pyramids and teaches farming and agriculture and make us more advanced so that's basically giving humanity's credit to the aliens but it, it could be we can't say that it can't be completely because they also have some good points so okay tapuvan here is writing they might have died due to lack of yeah yeah that could be possible that's what i said about longevity longevity that uh, if in like it could happen that they had a war or a pandemic and they killed themselves that's why we can't communicate them as of yet and also the most important fact is that the universe is just way too big it's just so so big that even if we want to reach the star closest to us the proxima centauri it is going to even if it's at a very very close speed of light even if we travel uh, at a speed which is very very close to light it's going to take at least about let's say 5 years because that's one parsec away and one parsec is approximately 4 light years so i'm assuming that it would at least take us 5 years to reach the nearest star system so it could be that ancient aliens actually were there and they came to us and maybe we are their offspring who knows also there is this theory that says that life might not have originated on earth it might have come from somewhere else some asteroid maybe so there are these theories as well so the other theory which was also shown in this show called genius which was hosted by stephen hawking so that's the great filter hypothesis so basically that's again longevity so first of all the thing is that you have to have a star and then you have to have a planet so the star is there now the planet is formed now after the planet is formed the planet can't just be completely rocky it needs to have water 
so basically what they did was in this experiment was that uh, from here they took a bucket full of balls and then they poured it here now a lot of balls were bouncing up and down here and then some of the balls came here and the number of balls which came here were a lot fewer compared to what was given um, poured here from the bucket and now even lesser balls came into this chamber and like yeah, as you can see like only two balls are here in this chamber so first of all we have a good probability of having planets we have a very good probability of stars having planets there are a lot of planets but uh, the probability of that planet being habitable or having liquid water specifically liquid water i should say because you can't exactly expect to have life on in ice unless of course we consider organisms such as the tardigrade everyone knows uh, everyone here knows about the tardigrades right the water bears which can survive very intense and extreme conditions in outer space as well so how many people here have heard about the tardigrades before can i have a show of hands and uh, can someone please tell me how many hands we are seeing it's increasing till now 5 okay 6 okay so i think 7 you can take it okay so seven, wait, 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 are... so ten okay 10 so i think people are more or less familiar with this odd looking creature called the tardigrade which has a very very good I and mean, what should i say good defense mechanism good surviving mechanism that it can live in very intense conditions as well but anyhow the as we all know the tardigrade is life but it's not exactly intelligent neither can it build radio telescopes or big communication devices and antennas for transmission or like acceptance of those transmission from other planets so anyhow so once as uh, we have a very good probability of having planets which have liquid water as well but the thing is that since earth is the only known planet which harbors life we are very unsure of the fact whether there is life anywhere else and let's say there is life in somewhere else like let's say that there has to be life somewhere else so that probability is going to be a lot lot less yeah 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 it can survive uh, survive in vacuum conditions also like all kinds of extreme conditions like you can just leave a tardigrade in space and then uh it will just survive there it can survive in space and uh, amongst a lot of radiation as well so this was uh, a common given by uh, abhinav singh it can survive in vacuum conditions also so yeah yeah so the great this is the great filter hypothesis basically so once this jump occurs once you come to the life part first of all it is very hard to have life have to have been formed in some other planet and it is even harder for that life to evolve into something intelligent now even if that life does develop into something intelligent and say that that intelligent life has indeed established radio communication there is still one small problem which is this so probably they are they didn't survive so maybe that's why they are not going and not being able to communicate with us so that's why maybe we are feeling so alone in space so till now we haven't found anything but uh, recently there was this study published in the uh, published by nottingham university so it stated that there are exactly 7 uh, sorry 36 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy now the thing is that 36 is way too accurate a number to just state so question is is that right so i had this doubt so i checked out seti basically and uh, i well like went to their website and then saw what said shostak has to say about that so the thing is that they made some assumptions for in order to get this number so we can't just go around making these assumptions so 
let's just see what those assumptions were. So the first assumption that they made was that uh, intelligent life forms on other planets in a similar way as it does on Earth. It doesn't necessarily have to write that the way the life is going to form elsewhere is going to be exactly the same as here on Earth. Because first of all, life is not something we are very sure of as to what we call life. Life is something very abstract, something we do not even under, begin to understand yet. Like all we know about li uh, life is how to differentiate living things from non-living things. Like we know that life tries to survive, it tries to reproduce, it uh, like it l tries to live on, it moves, it shows locomotion, and things like that. It responds to stimulus. So that's all we can say. Like that's just differentiating the living things from the non-living things. We don't exactly know what life is. So we can't just say for sure that there is only one way that life can form. There can be also other kinds of life as well. So also uh, it takes about 4.5 to 5 billion years for the emergence of life. This is also one of the things that they assumed. Then they assumed that all have sun-like stars. So basically they're, what they're trying to assume is that let there be other uh, exoplanetary systems which are very very similar to that of the solar system and the worst thing that they did was that they assumed the value of L which is the longevity in the Drake's equation so they assumed that the longevity the period for which the aliens are going to live is 100 years so that's kind of pessimistic in a way that we are trying to say that the aliens just died away after a hundred years of developing radio communication because we humans are still alive right now in 2020 even though we have the coronavirus anyway but still we are alive and well and we are still 7.78 billion strong and this is 120 years after the initial uses of radio waves so basically in our case l equals 120 our longevity for radio communication is 120 years and heading up so basically, they did publish a paper, but just because they are the University of Nottingham and they published a paper doesn't mean that it's right. So these are some of the false, I mean, bad assumptions, I should say, that they made. Anyways, the number of alien civilizations in our galaxy could be somewhere near a million. It could be 100. It could be 37. It could be maybe five. Like it could be anything. We have very, very little idea about how many alien civilizations could there be in our galaxy itself. Because we have very little data about life as a whole, about how it's formed initially, how it came in the initial stages. I mean, what made chemistry and physics into biology, that transition from non-living to living, we have very little idea about. So we can't just as you go and assume something like this and then come up with a value so accurate as 36. So it's necessary, not necessarily 36 exactly. It can be anything actually. Like you can make your own assumptions and then find all kinds of results. So okay, apart from that, so as of now, we haven't found any aliens yet, but we can always ask them like, hello, aliens, we are here. So this is basically Kimi no Dokoga, Japanese for where are you? And this is the golden record, which NASA had sent in the year 1977. So this was part of the two Voyager missions, which it sent. So since we haven't yet heard anything from the aliens, so we decided to, okay, so this is the vast sea of space. So let's write something in a paper, put it in a bottle and just throw it out in the ocean. And let's see whether someone picks up that bottle and opens that glass prop um, bottle properly in proper conditions and then tries to read what I have written in it. And then hopefully communicate back to us. So we tried to communicate the aliens now. So this happened in 1977. Voyager 1, 
and Voyager 2. So, okay, uh, would anyone like to guess exactly when in 1977 Voyager 1, Voyager 1 was launched? Would anyone like to guess? Okay, let's see the chat. Um, okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, like, would anyone like to guess at which point in the year 1977 we decided to launch this Voyager 1? Like, yeah, just guess anything. You can even write in the chat box. You can either write in the chat box or unmute your mind, mic and just say, just take a guess, take a wild guess. And the hint is that it's very middle of the year. It's right in the middle of the year, actually. Would anyone like to take a guess? Just, yeah, okay, very good, okay, very, very good guess. Okay, now, we, uh, like, that's a very good guess, September, okay. Like, try to home in on the date now, the exact date. It's a very interesting date, actually. Yes, yes, correct, correct. Fifth September, yeah. So it was Teacher's Day when this was launched, Voyager 1. Okay, now let's talk about Voyager 2. Would anyone like to guess the date on which Voyager 2 was launched? Just guess, just take a wild guess. It's obviously somewhere very near Voyager 1's launch date. It's not very far apart. But still, like, try to guess when Voyager 2 was launched. Just take a wild guess. Okay, I got this. Oh, okay. So you you already know that means. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So some people here know this properly. So yeah, Voyager 2 was actually launched before Voyager 1. So um, 28 August 1977. And so we had these missions mainly planned for the two voyages. So Voyager 2 was actually supposed to study these two planets here, Uranus and Neptune. This trajectory that it took here was basically a flyby. Flyby as in a gravity assist. So what it did was there's a planet here. This is the spacecraft. You go and make a slingshot around that planet. So you basically use this planet's gravity and then you slingshot and go towards the, your destination by making very calculated, precise amounts of pushes and stops. So basically that was the route intended for Voyager 2. And as for Voyager 1, the main intention was to study Jupiter and Saturn. So these Voyager missions were particularly chosen for studying the outer planets of the solar system. Because as we all know that Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune are separated from the rocky planets, the interior planets by an asteroid belt. So we had to study them more closely. So we sent our voyages and studied them. So after the voyages studied them, we were like, okay, they have already gone this far into the solar system. So let's just let them just go. So like, let's just see what happens if they just keep going. So on December 10th, 2018, the both the voyages had crossed the boundaries of our solar system and had officially entered interstellar space beyond our solar system. So it's not that far back. So this is a picture of planet Earth taken from one of the voyages. This is a pale blue dot. This, this is where we are right now. That's how small we are. So now, as I said, the Voyager missions were like, you write something in a paper, you're on in an ocean, in a small boat, and you are writing something in a paper and then rolling it up, putting it in a bottle and then just throwing it away in the ocean, hoping that some seafarer will someday pick that bottle, like basically intercept that bottle, open it up properly and read whatever you have written. So that's the thing with the golden records. So we have just tossed away the bottle right now. So we have no idea whether 
any alien, intelligent alien civilizations are going to be just roaming around there and they will just happen to like pick that bottle up and see what's inside it. So these are some of the things that we have inside that bottle or rather the golden record. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, the chat, okay. So these are some of the things which we sent. So basically we are trying to give the aliens as much data about us as possible. That was the main intention. So we'll come to the fact what, that what they might do with the data later so as of now let's see but i don't think the audio is coming very well so let's see whether the thing plays uh was everyone able to hear that hello no no that wasn't audible. I... am i audible yeah yes yeah like nothing is audible on your screen Okay, so these things are not getting heard. Okay, so basically the audio that, that, that I just played was Hello from the Children of Planet Off. This is the English version actually. Hello from the Children of Planet Earth. This is the it's Japanese there version. It's on Wikipedia, right? No, actually these I have downloaded from directly the NASA's uh, website. No, no, the, the, this particular Voyager uh, part, like the Hello from the Children of the Earth. Yeah. So yeah, this is there on Wikipedia. Yeah, probably it's there. Actually, while, uh, yeah. when I was researching for these materials, I strictly stick to whatever NASA and SETI and National Geographic had said about these. So I didn't exactly go to Wikipedia. But uh, yeah, it cool. should be there. Probably cool. it should cool. be there. Yeah. Cool. Because this is very famous and it's in English, so. Uh, also, we have. Uh, you just do yeah. one thing. You just can click on that this icon, and you can get there is an option for increasing volume of the presentation. Not your computer uh, volume. I'm saying the presentation volume. Um, volume. Just check it. Once. Presentations volume. One minute. Mm -hmm. You just click on the. Hmm. I can't see anything to raise the you presentation. Just click on the icon where this icon is there. This you can also okay. try from the source you got the records. Just try from directly. Oh, from you can, okay. Right, okay, you can wait, wait. That will just take a minute. Yeah, can I can click, click this icon. That, take that way. Yeah, wait. It will just take me a moment, one minute. I think that will be more easier than playing yeah, this yeah. or fixing this stuff. Yeah, let's just do that. Yeah, that's a better idea. Just a moment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. This can be done. Okay, so yeah, here are the greetings. So the greetings that I've put in here are in four languages that are English, Japanese, Bengali and Urdu. So this is the Japanese version. Let me, if you can hear it. One minute. Okay, one minute. It says the format isn't supported. It's only audio, right? It's not the video. You are playing the audio. Yeah, yeah. You try yeah, to play yeah. it on your phone and hold the phone to the microphone. I think yeah, that's that what I'm trying. Good. But it says format is not supported. Uh, one minute. Let me, let me try playing this. Otherwise, this should not have happened. OK. 
Okay, so no, there is a technical difficulty here. Uh, no, it's not exactly possible to do it here. Do it, uh, no. No, it's not. Mm. So I think better you forget about it and yeah. proceed the presentation. That or uh, did you but share the just... computer audio while sharing screen? Yeah, uh, yeah, I did share the computer audio with. Mm. Okay. So oh, sorry, like... sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm very sorry about this one. Oh ho, oh. I should have done this. Yes, sorry. Uh, now just check. Hello from the children of planet Earth. Was this audible this time? Yes, 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 very much. Yes, ah. oh. So sorry. Yeah, I should have checked that. Yeah, the, the computer audio was not sharing. So that was English. That was Japanese saying, uh, hello, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. Ham zameen ke rehne. वालों की तरफ से आपको खुश आमदीद कहते हैं। I think everyone got the Urdu right. नमस्कार, विश्व शांति हो। And that was the Bengali one. Okay. कौन इच्छा? ओगेन की देश का? नमस्कार, विश्व शांति हो। Okay, so these are some of the images that Voyager has. So basically what we tried was to make them understand how our DNA was formed and all. So this is the, this is some information which we are giving to them about our DNA, our genetic makeup. And this is how our math works. So as you can see, there are a lot of symbols used here with which we are trying to communicate to them that see that this is how we have defined the symbols and so this is how we write the numbers and this is how we do our math so would anyone like to guess like this is an astronaut this is an astronaut this is obvious so would anyone like to guess what this image is yes sir the movement of our plates or the yeah the continents yeah then the plate tectonic the continental drift and the yeah, yeah. hands Correct. are the evolution of the human. Now, where do we are now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. So this is basically the continental drift, which we are trying to convey the aliens. And uh, would anyone like to guess which building this is? Like, try to guess which building this can be. You because when... when... You ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you know this from the beginning? Uh, yeah, I think because it's pretty much common, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much common also, like, when we are going to present ourselves to the aliens, we can't just say that we are so many different countries and we are constantly at war with each other. So they might try and use that against us. So we should rather say that, look, we are united. So that's UN building, United Nations. Okay, so here we have five, I'm, ju I'm just giving like five examples. Oh, was it? Uh, probably, I don't know. Yeah, it's written on the left side, but I try to cover it. Okay, so so these five are just some of the songs and music, which which we have set, uh, recorded in that golden record. So this here is a rock music. Some people might have heard it. Like, how many people have heard this one? Johnny Be Good. Like somewhere, it's all. It was also in a fa very famous movie. This particular song. Has anybody heard it? Can I have a show of hands? Two hands. With three hands. Okay, so can anybody tell me which movie this was? 
it's a very famous movie i haven't heard it in a movie i have heard the original not in a movie okay but this was actually not actually sung by the original i mean it wasn't sung by chuck berry it was sung by the actor playing a certain part in that movie would anybody like to guess which movie that is it's a very old movie it's a science fiction any guesses is it star trek no that's a good guess but uh, no Back not star trek future. yes yes oh. correct this is what marty was trying to perform after he successfully saved himself from getting wiped out from the past or future whatever timeline was so after that we also have classics from beethoven from bach mozart also from various countries such as japan and uh, then we have things like these sorry the sound of a train in back in the 1970s and 60s and this is was able to hear that right so the first one was a train and this one was a dog howling a wild dog howling so these are some of the things which have been recorded there in the golden record actually the thing is that the golden records project was a very big one where there were a lot of people involved and they were traveling all across the globes to get as much exposure as possible starting from those 55 greetings in different languages and then these sounds from various places of the earth the music of various cultures and of people from various various varied parts of the earth i mean just like these are just five of those like there are a lot of them uh, i showed the number just now so how many were there yeah so yeah 90 minutes of music yeah there were 55 greetings but uh, the no, music music was 90 minute 90 minutes of songs and then other sounds from earth konnichiwa so let's just skip okay so the final question is say that they have found the bottle and say that basically they have got the golden record they played it they liked it and they learned a lot of things about us and all the while we are we don't know anything about them so they know about us we don't know about them and uh, say that they decide to contact us so like how many people have seen this movie can i have a show of hands so like how many hands are there no one no one no one has seen this one this is a pretty famous movie contact so if you haven't seen this movie like you can give it a watch this is basically a movie which is science fiction but it kind of shows how seti was initially formed because no one wants to spend money on a institution which is just looking up there and seeing whether we have whether there are habitable worlds out there or whether there is life out there or rather intelligent life or whether anyone is trying to contact us or not so the question is that let's say that they do contact us so will they be friendly or could there be some other consequences as well so this is as you all know this is stephen hawking and the person on the right is set shostak 
he is the head astronomer of SETI. So he is the head astronomer of SETI. And so both of them have two different points which I'd like to share here. So let's see. So Hawk, uh, Hawking actually warned us about contacting the aliens because the thing is that we don't exactly as humans, we don't exactly have a very good past when it comes to exploration and finding another species or other, other people, I have to say, because when Christopher Columbus found America, instead of finding India or whatever, and whatever his aim was to find, because Christopher Columbus wasn't exactly a very bright guy. Anyways, when he did find America, he called those people Red Indians. And the thing is that he simply went and killed them. So the Native Americans are, the Americans which are in America today, they are not, none of them are Native. The Native Americans are basically dead. So that's a bad thing which happened in history. So that's the thing he was warning us about that. Could it be that when in the future the aliens come, they are actually more advanced than us and therefore when they come, they want to conquer Earth for their own habitation. So what they do is they can just try and be at war with the humans and try to wipe out the human civilization. So this is basically something like World War Z all over again. So the question is that will they be nice to us or will this be another encounter like we had, like the Europeans had rather with the Red, Ameri uh, Red Indians. So this is Hawking's opinion. And this here it, uh, is Seth Rostak's opinion that any society with the capability to threaten Earth is First of all, it's overwhelmingly likely to already have the kit required to pick up the leakage we have been sending. So by leakage, we mean that uh, what he means is that we have been, we have developed radio communications for 120 years now. And whenever we broadcast something, it goes in all directions. So basically if they were that advanced, so as to come and dominate us and like try to kill us or enslave us, they would have probably done that by now because Earth, even though Earth is a very, very small planet in the corner of a, in a small corner of the Milky Way galaxy in one of the arms, it's actually emanating a lot of, a lot of signals on, in a lot of frequencies. Every time we do a radio broadcast or uh, try to communicate with each other on radio communications. There is always a like there is always a very good amount of leakage that happens, wherein the radio waves cross our atmosphere and they just escape into space. So, if the alien civilizations did have the capability of enslaving us or something, then they would have probably done so by now. So, as we can see, they haven't yet. But we can't say it. They might be pointing at their traitors right now with their cloaking tech or something. But they haven't killed us yet. So we are safe as of now. And also the other opinion which he makes is that it's been already way too late for us to ask what, I mean, for us to worry about that. Because we have already like sent bottles out into the ocean. And first of all, those bottles will have to be picked up by some intelligent being, read, interpreted, and then they will decide whether or not to come at come to us with war or with peace. Hopefully, it will be peace since life is not that common in the universe and life is something very, very rare. So hopefully, they will understand us and try to make peace with us. So that being said, this brings us to the end question that even after all this, we are try looking at the sky and we are trying our best to find life elsewhere out there in the universe. 
we haven't exactly found anything. It's like we are just staring at the sky with our all our fancy gadgets and all, and we haven't really got something very good. So question is, why should we keep doing it? And what are we really doing? That we still have very very little idea about if a life itself exists anywhere else other than Earth. And even if it does, if it's even in the slightest possibility, an intelligent life. So this is Jill Tata. She was one of the founders of the SETI. And uh, she had something along the lines of this to say that uh, it's not that we aren't finding anything every day because day after day when we search the skies and end up with nothing, we know that we need to improve and sophisticate further upon our searches. So we find newer technologies and methods which are far, far sophisticated than its predecessors. And the fact that we haven't found anything yet simply means that we simply have to keep looking deep and farther into the cosmos and that we are yet to reach such a state of technology with which we will finally be able to detect or at least ascertain the fact as to whether or not we truly are alone and so so special in this universe which is as of now uh, uh, up till what we have observed till now is completely devoid of life because we haven't seen life anywhere happen anywhere other than earth which is like so so special in the universe and so is cosmos therefore really a that bigger waste of space or Will there be aliens somewhere? And how interesting would that be when we indeed find life somewhere else other than Earth and then intelligent life one day? And like, what would that mean for us? So with those questions asked, that's it from me. That's the end. So does anyone have any questions um, about the observation techniques? astrometry, uh, gravitational microlensing. Hello. Hello. Was anyone asking something? So uh, should I briefly say about uh, say something about the gravitational mi microlensing techniques or the astrometry techniques. Is there any question? Yeah, or uh, is there any question? Okay, thank you. So what exactly qualifies as life in the first place? So what are the, exactly the signs of life you're looking for? Oh, uh, the kinds of light which, uh, which we are... Hello? Yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. okay uh, so li by light, what I mean is basically electromagnetic radiation. Not light, I meant light. So not just visible light. light. Not light, light, light. Like Sorry? Light. Oh, light. Yeah, right. So as I said that we have no idea as to what life truly is. What we can say is that what's the difference between something which is living and something which is not living. Like that's all which we can say. So what life should essentially mean is that it should have a capability of reproduction. It should be able to produce more of itself given our favored environment. And not just producing more of itself, it should be able to copy its traits and like, give birth to offsprings and also like keep searching not just keep, ser um, keep searching as in to survive it should be able to survive but primarily we are not very clear as to what life truly is so all that we can say that the life form which we are looking for is going to be responsive of stimulus it's going to understand and it's going to behave in a certain way which is similar to life we have here on earth because life and living things and non-living things have a lot of differences. And even, even if let's say that that life, which we find 
is not exactly made up of DNA. It's com- made up of completely something else entirely. Like that life will have certain aspects of it, which are a lot similar to the life we see on earth. So I guess that uh, that's when we will just see what are the similarities between us. So basically the, whatever life is out there, the primary aspect should be that it is going to reproduce more of itself and that it's going to like, it's going to basically respond to any kind of change in its environment. It's going to react. Basically that's like awareness. It's going to be aware of certain things which is happening in its environment and change accordingly. So that's the kind of life or the definition of life that we hope to find or that we are looking for, basically. How sufficient stimulus are you considering? Sorry? How, how sufficient stimulus are you considering? Uh, okay, so there's this theory that uh, the aliens which we find, hopefully, like, first of all, in order to find life, finding life itself is a very very difficult task for example uh, in that transit method if the planet is not transiting the star we will not be able to find that uh, planet in the first place that way we will have to use some other techniques as well so after even after if we do find life like um if we, even if we do find life like the stimulus which we will be looking for is probably very sensitive. For example, the life form does not exactly need to have all the senses which we have, the sense of sight, smell, hearing. But uh, if it is ad- uh, advanced enough, if it does have the capability of being an intelligent life form, at least because we can't detect uh, life that far away if their life is just microbes and all. But if they are in fact intelligent, then they should at least have the sense of touch. So what we are trying to essentially look for is is whether that thing, that form of life at least responds to some sort of stimulus based on the central sensation of touch. That's primarily what we would like to see. Are you qualifying intelligent life forms as being those life forms that are responsive, responsive to touch? Yes, to some extent, yes. Because if uh, even if they don't, let's say, have the sense of touch, they will at least have to have one of the five senses which we have but uh, saying touch is because touch is something very very essential for any life form to have because like even if you can't see or hear anything touch by the sensation of touch you can at least know what's going on out there in your environment you can feel hot or you can feel cold or you can feel the pressure of uh, pushing your hand against something you can like you they get get like with the sensation of touch you get the data that there is something here so if intelligent life has to evolve then the theory suggests that we that the intelligent life should have the sensation of touch otherwise we are uh, like walking on a very thin line here like we have very little idea as to whether even life exists so Essentially, that's how we are quantifying it. That if there is intelligent life somewhere, it should have at least the sensation of touch, if not any other senses. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Would you mind if I ask you a non scientific question regarding your talk? Uh, yeah, okay. Sure. So, every paradigm change that has uh, questioned religious or religions or society. Uh, has impacted the socio religious con- uh, socio religious situation right so yeah what do you think might be the socio religious impact of such a discovery finding life outside earth so socio religious impact uh, i'm not very sure about what is going to happen because that is something literally very out of this world but what we can expect is that there will be some people who might accept more uh, powerful beings as maybe God or, or maybe humans are not, maybe they are not going to accept them as well. Or because like there are some humans who have the capability of thinking extremely scientifically, logically and thinking in a manner which 
quantifies everything the way they are. Like some people have the way of looking at things the way they are. Then there are some who like to believe in what they have already know. Some people are good at accepting new things. Some people are not. So it will completely depend upon the ratio of those two kinds of people, whether that person can accept something new the way it is or whether they can't. So that's primarily it. So I have no idea what might happen to the social religious cultures, but either they are going to accept it or they are not going to. All right, all right. Uh, that's all from my side. Sorry? Yeah, that's all from my side. Okay. I don't think I have any... yeah.